inspired, really excellent. And uh, thank you for uh, all of those who came to greet me this morning. I felt so loved. <laughs> But uh, the, the point was, it <laughs> wasn't to greet me, it wasn't about me. It never is. Um, it's that we actually step out and greet one another and connect with one another. Uh, it's, it's a great place to start. Um, but then, uh, yeah, we also move beyond ourselves and beyond me. And, uh, and then a special welcome to Colleen Lemon in the house, Nochals. And the only that uh, came all the way from Australia, her daughter. Miss Nachi, it is wonderful to have you in Liberty this morning. Right, we're talking about the love of God. And um, I actually sent a message to the, the leaders this, this week saying, why do you love God? Because as soon as you start typing out something on the love of God, it makes you think. And you know, I don't know about them, about you, but sometimes we... We tend to become aware of the things that God gives us, that he does for us. I, I really love God because he gave me this wonderful daughter. Love God because it's just look how good he is to me. Look at this, this lovely house I get to live in, or whatever. And we almost have a, I don't want to call it the materialistic love of God, but I, um, I looked at it and I thought, hmm, you know, sometimes it's good to pin down or to give thought to why I love God. Do I love him? Do I seek his face or do I seek his hand? Do I love him because he's, he's showered me with all sorts of goodness, even good health? It doesn't have to be material things. But um, yeah, do, I, do I love him in spite of, in a sense? It is the book of Habakkuk draws to an end. Though there's no this, no, not that, any of that. Or that still I will love you. Because it's not about all these other things. So, in Matthew 22, well-known scripture, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, prepared this question, and he said, teacher, what is the greatest command in the law? What is the greatest command in the law? Now, we all know the answer that Jesus gave, but I want us to stop there for a moment. Um, I'm not going to tell the story again, but it's, it's vital in life as Professor R. C. S. L. here said, it's vital in life that we don't not only know the answer, but we also know the question to which it is the answer. Very profound for quite a philosophic professor that I had. In life, it's not enough to know the answer. It's also good to know the question to which it is the answer. So look at this question. He's actually asking Jesus, in your opinion, what is the greatest command that God has ever given? That's weighty. Jesus, in your opinion, what do you think is the greatest command that God has ever given? What do you say? And then Jesus answers, he says, love. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength, all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. In fact, I think the two can actually be split into three. He speaks of love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, love yourself. He says all the law and the prophets, all the Old Testament, all the things that you've been hanging on to, the, the law of Moses and the prophets, all of that can be combined into just these two things. Years ago, we, we had a, a church um, magazine that came out um, Initially monthly, and then it became too much work. So we went to every second month, and that became too much work. We went to once a, a term, and that became too much work, so we just closed it down. But in any event, while it was still running, we, we did a, a feature on someone in the body. Um, and remember the one, once we, we uh, focused on Gareth Jeans, Gareth and Lynn Jeans, if you know them. And um, one of the questions that was there, I think it was the last question, was, what is your favorite quote? And his quote was, and, and I kind of got quite a bit of flack that we printed this, his quote was, love God and do as you please. Shocking. Love God and do as you please. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. If you love the Father, then you will do what pleases him. 
If you do what you please, it will be doing what pleases him. It's not love God and run around in a licentious way. That's not what he meant. That's not what he said. All right. So on, on Rusk Sunday, I almost said on Love Sunday. It could have been Love Sunday. On Rusk Sunday, last week, we, um, we shared our vision. And um, some of you came for the first time and thought this is what it looks like every Sunday with tables and chairs and coffee and tea and rusks and all sorts of excitement. We apologize. You'll have to wait until breakfast Sunday, which is probably the first Sunday of July, but, but there is another festive, festive one coming up, but uh, only it's about six months' time. So we, we shared the vision. The vision was love, to love. And so do we love because it's a command? And in fact, Jesus said, it is the greatest command? I trust not. I trust that we will never love because we are commanded to love, but that we rather love because the love of Christ compels us, as Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, uh, the Corinthians church, sorry, the Corinthian church, not the Colossian church, to never settle for less than what Christ died to give us. In other words, a restoration to the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, a life right here on earth, but living restored, restored through faith, so that there's nothing separating us from him. We are redeemed, we are forgiven, our sin has been removed, we have been placed, please listen to this carefully, we've been placed in a place as if the fall has not happened yet. We've been reversed in history to before the fall by being reunited by God. Sin has no mastery over us anymore, but we are serving that master, a new master, our Lord and Savior, moment by moment, and we, we are serving by loving, moment by moment. This is what Paul said when he wrote to them. He said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. And all this is from God. Firstly, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and then secondly, who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He reconciled us, and he gives us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not, causing, not counting men's sin against them. And as he committed to us the message of reconciliation, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So we say, we implore you therefore, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, such a walk, if, if that penny drops, and we're living reconciled to God, and we're living in order to reconcile others to God, that walk with God, that form of Christianity, if you can call it that, can never be boxed in. It can never be categorized. We can't limit that to a Sunday morning, to a meeting or a life group meeting somewhere in the week, or to a quiet time in the morning, some form of an expression. Now, it's an, it's an all consuming fire. It is at the very core of my very being. It's living life out there, consumed by his love and compelled by his love. Now, something like that was possible. Something like what? Something like what I've just said. Us as believers, living not only in these moments, these pockets of Christianity or outliving our Christianity in these pockets in a venue where it's safe and nobody else can see us, but where we actually live our Christianity out there, not weirdly, not, not in an in a, in a off-putting, condemning, finger-pointing, Bible-bashing way, but in a loving way, in, in a way that attracts people. Jesus was like a magnet to people. And the amazing thing is, he wasn't only a magnet to those who loved him, he was a magnet to those who loved to sin. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? But that we actually live this life. If this was possible, this was my question, if this was possible, why hasn't it happened yet? It's been 2,000 years since Jesus made that statement. This is the first, the greatest command, this is the second. It's been we had 2,000 years of practice. Why, why haven't we gotten there yet? And so it, it, it sounds like, like quite a, a question, quite a complex question. 
And sometimes, you know, when we listen to a question that seems complex, we, we want to answer it with a, with a complex answer. And then that would really be a mistake because the gospel is the answer. And the gospel is simple. It's a gospel for the poor. It's not a, a gospel for, for the complex few. It's not a gospel for an elitist few. And so I believe that the answer is really simple. A number of years ago, I felt God say to me, it wasn't audible or anything. It was just a, something that God dropped in my heart. A very simple line. And the line was, my people do not love me because they do not know me. Make me known. My people do not love me because they do not know me. Make me known. And when he says my people, I don't think he was referring to us as believers sitting in churches on a Sunday morning. It's my people. I mean, most of the lost are still lost because they don't know him. Because to know him is to love him. Let's continue. Make me known. It's a simple instruction, but I believe that it's an instruction to all of us, to every single church, but also to every single believer, to every one of us. It's one of those that we, we don't delegate. We don't drop something in the offering hoping that therefore somebody else will pick up that which I should be doing. We'll connect with my neighbor, my employer, my employees, my friends. And when I say, my people do not love me because they do not know me, make me known, it's not some cheap shot at stirring up guilt. <laughs> I'm not trying to motivate you by condemnation. It's not an accusation. It's not a case of how well do you know God? Do you know him well enough? What are you doing to get to know him better? How long? How often? How much? That's not the question. No, but I really believe that it's, it's the cry of God's heart. A God who wants to make himself known. A God who wants to be found. A God who wants to be known. A God who wants to be loved. So we walk this walk, this walk of reality with him. This is not a, our Christianity is not a virtual tour. It's not finding clues that we puzzle together at the end of life, trying to, to figure God out or to find him. But it's being led by him. It's a walk that will see the, the church arise in love with God, flowing in his power, which is found in the commissioning of his presence. That really is a beautiful line. It's a walk that will see the church arise in love with their God and flowing in his power, which is found in the commissioning of his presence. Recently, I heard the, the old lie again, where someone said, made the, kind of, not kind of, made the acquisition I cannot love a God that condemns and sends people to hell. I cannot love a God that condemns people and sends them to hell. How can I accept him and worship him? And when we walk with God, we need to be able to give an answer to a statement such as that. And so this will be some of the answer. Today we're going to just simply look very briefly at a God of love. Other side of the coin, the love of God. And so God is love. His essence, his eternal essence, his unchanging nature is love. But then sometimes we, we think of some of the things that we read in the Old Testament and we think, oh, that's... some of these guys, they... they they receive the, the backhand of God's love. So it, it would seem that fortunately, we're on this side of the cross. Fortunately, we're on this side of the covenant. We're in the new covenant, not the old covenant. We don't have to deal with grumpy God. We get, to, we get nice God. 
Fortunately, we're not under the old covenant of the Old Testament. Somehow, at some stage, God changed his nature and he became nicer. He realized that grumpy God wasn't going to fly, and so he changed his nature. Now, the, the thing is that God was never a God of condemnation, God of wrath. That some, somehow, in time, became milder mannered, more socially acceptable. Exodus 34, verse 6, that, that's pretty far back. I think you'll, you'll agree. In Exodus 34, verse 6, it says that God passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Nehemiah, he describes, he describes the stubborn Israelites to God. He describes God's people to God. I mean, in all honesty, he wasn't the first one to do it. Moses did the same. Moses also moaned. He says, these, I didn't give birth to these people. They're your, your people. You sought them out. Nehemiah comes and he says, they refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles that you performed among them. They became stiff-necked in their rebellion. And they appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. And therefore, you never deserted them. He's, he's amazed. This God of the Old Testament. Jonah. <laughs> Jonah's quite classic. Jonah, Jonah complains to God for, for being so nice. <laughs> Where is this God of wrath that I need when I need him? That's Jonah's call. Jonah is miffed with God for not destroying Nineveh. Oh Lord, is, not, is this not exactly what I said when I left home? Is this not why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish? I knew you. I knew that you are gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. This is my issue with you. This is my complaint against you. I promised them condemnation. I promised them wrath. And you don't deliver. Now I look stupid. And then you take away my lekker skardivikis. Moving on. David. David knew the heart of God. Even in, in the midst of his, his own foolishness. In his repentance he writes Psalm 51. You don't have it, don't worry. And as he, he writes Psalm 51, you know that it starts off by saying, a Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And David says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. And so the nature of God in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant just rolls forward from, from one to the other. And it's the nature of a, of a loving God, a compassionate God. And so my friend with a, with a lovely name, if, uh, if one of you are looking for a, a boy's name, call him Zephaniah. <laughs> but then he, he will have to drive a Ford. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Zephaniah. It just sounds Zeph. In any event, so Zeph writes in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, and he summarizes because he's quite, you know, he's, he comes quite at the, uh, towards the end of the Old Testament. So for me, it's a summary. It says, The Lord your God is with you, He's mighty to save. He will take great delight in you, He will quiet you with His love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. I hope you've highlighted that somewhere in your Bible. Well, not somewhere. In Zephaniah three seventeen, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice. He, God, will rejoice over you with singing. This is the God that we serve. 
Why do we love God? The eternal God. This is who He was and who He is. And so if we, if we wrap that up for the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and just look at a couple of things in the New Testament. And this new and, and better covenant. Then the thing is that, that many people, and, and I think even many Christians, maybe, maybe ask yourself this question. Do not realize that God loved them before they even became Christians. It's, it's almost a thing that we, we, we think we'd be born down here at minus 100. And we have to climb a ladder to zero and then just, just clean up a bit, really. Just make your bed, clean your room, brush your teeth, clean up a bit. And then God will start to like you, and then maybe at some stage he'll actually love you. But actually it says, while we were still lost in our darkness, while we were living for ourselves, for our own pleasures as enemies of God, he already loved us. The famous or well-known Romans 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, God loved us. 1 John 4, 19. We love because he loved us first. We love because he loved us first. God loved us first. He did not wait for us to seek him out. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about his love for us. He didn't wait for us to seek him out or to clean up our act, to, to become deserving to somehow make daddy proud. And he simply loved us. And he completely loved us. Not holding anything back. So John, 1 John, sorry, 1 John 4, 9 says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is how he loved. He sent and he did that we might live through him. A second pointer. He showed his love through this ultimate sacrifice. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Have you ever read that and, and picked up, but there's something wrong with this verse? Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Obviously referring to Christ. But actually, Jesus has greater love than that because he did not only lay down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for his enemies. He laid down his life for all of us so that all of us can be saved. John three sixteen and 17, For God so loved the world. This week I was re reading a book by a very well-known author. He passed away. He, was, he lived in the 1800s and so on. Really in uh, well-known author, but, but so stuck in, in his theory on predestination and election that he even writes that this verse, the world should not be seen as the world, but only the elect in the world. What utter rubbish. For God so loved the world that he gave his son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that this, the world may be saved through him. A God that sends people to hell. What nonsense. Sends no hell. We'll come back to that. A love that is set, that is constant, that is complete, that is unconditional. We cannot earn it. We do not deserve it, and we cannot even attract it. That's the terrible thing, isn't it? We can't be, we can't clean ourselves up and, and become more attractive to God, attract more of His love. I think we still think we can. That's why you're not amazed. A love that cannot be earned, cannot be deserved, and cannot even be attracted, because God is already fully and completely loving us. His love is completely unconditional on our performance, his side. 
God's love for us is not prompted by anything in us. It is not a reactive love. It is a original love, a spontaneous love. We have nothing within us to attract God with. We cannot add a bit of aftershave or perfume or whatever to attract God to us. Paul says, I know that nothing good lives in me. And yet, because of this unconditional love, the same Paul writes in the next chapter, although nothing good lives in me, in, in, the, in the fleshly me, I also know that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, or power or any powers or the height or depth or anything else, in all of creation, he runs out of things to say, height, depth, lungs, rest, all the rest, He's looking for more dimensions, and then he says, well, anything else in all of creation, none of that can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We cannot attract it, but we have all of it. It's impossible to escape it. God's love is available to all of mankind. It is there for the taking. All that we have to do is to accept it, to receive it. It's the gift of spiritual life is very much like the gift of natural life. Something just has to happen. Someone needs to give you a smack on the backside so you can go, ah! you can breathe. So you can breathe in oxygen and have life. And so you simply have to accept the free oxygen around you and have natural life. And so with a spiritual life, to accept Christ, to breathe in the forgiveness of Christ, to receive his lordship, and to have life. And yet sometimes we see people, have you ever seen, I hope not teenagers, but, but uh, toddlers doing a tantrum where they, where they hold their breath, Go stand it till I go blue, and then, <laughs> in any event, holding my breath in a tantrum, I am not going to breathe the free air. <laughs> I know it's silly, but, but sometimes when we look back at ourselves and our own lives, that's exactly what we were like spiritually. We refuse to, to breathe in the life of God. We don't. Standing there, I'm going to spite God by not accepting Him. And I stand here, hold my breath, and not receive His free gift of life. Because I cannot accept a God that will send people to hell. God's essence fills both heaven and earth, and God's essence is love. God's love is unlimited. It can never run out, just like God never ceases. God can never run out, can never stop to be, and therefore his love can never run out. And so again, Paul writes and he says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. To know a love that surpasses knowledge. The love of God, like himself, never changes. It is fixed. In John 13, verse 1, different translations, puts it differently. It says that he loved them with a complete love. But then other, other scriptures speaks of not the full extent of his love. It actually says he loved them to the end, right to the end. And not the end of, of his earthly life, of his incarnation. He loved us to the end. Moving on, love. God's love is a, is a burning or consuming fire. It's a passionate love. It's a holy love. For some that were getting nervous Initially, it's going to ground you, this one. God's love is not in conflict with the rest of his personality, if we can call it that, the rest of his character. 
God's love is not in conflict with his holiness. God's love is not licentious. God's love is not winking at sin, condoning it. God's love is not a, a weak love, compromising the rest of his nature. It's very clear in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse, verse 6, it says that God disciplines those whom he loves. His love is pure, it's holy, it's uncompromising. And therefore, in John 14, verse 6, it does say, in fact, Jesus does say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and therefore no one comes to the Father except through me. So therefore that means that the only way that I can force myself into hell, past all the barricades that Jesus put up in front of its entrance, is to refuse the love of God, the love of Jesus, the free gift of salvation. Hell was never intended for us as humans. There's a, a thought. Matthew 25, 41 reads as follows. Then he, the righteous judge, Christ himself, will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. It does say that the way to righteousness is narrow, and the way to destruction is wide. I want to say that it, it used to be. It used to be a wide road. But then you see, God placed the cross in the middle of that as a big barricade. Do not enter. The cross was planted on that wide road, arms wide. Do not pass. Do not enter. Destruction awaits you. And he barricaded, in a sense, the way into hell. And so the only way for us to get there is to hold our breath, <gasps> suck in our gut, and squeeze past the barricades of the cross and to make our way into the abyss. Refusing to repent and to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's the only way we can miss out on an eternity with him. The love and the favor, I'm closing with this, the, the love and the favor of God can never be separated. Because, God's, because God loves us, he favors us. Because of the great love that God has for us, he favors us. Christ died for us, not to make God love us, but because God loved us already. Christ died for us not to make God love us, but because God loved us already. He took our sins on him and paid the price for those sins. The cross of Christ is therefore the ultimate demonstration of the love of God. So whenever you are tempted to doubt God's love in a moment, and perhaps a season of, of hardship, or a, a season of mourning, a season of loss perhaps, if ever you are at a place where you are doubting God's love, think of the wonder of the cross. Whenever you think, is God really for me? Do I really have favor with God? Think back to the cross and realize this is how much God loved me. This is what the Father said, this is how much I love you, that I will hold nothing back from you. 1 John 4, 9 to 10 says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an eternal sacrifice for our sins. That's favor. That's love. That's our God. A God of love. So what is our verdict? Our verdict is that our God is a God of love. And our part is to receive 
and to accept that love. God wants to make himself known. My people do not love me because they do not know me. Make me known. God wants to be known. He wants to make himself known. He wants to make himself known by and through us. As Paul wrote, he says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as if God is making his appeal through us. Therefore, we urge you, be reconciled to God. This week you'll have opportunities, opportunities right here, a coffee shop later on, opportunities in the life groups meeting all over in the city, but opportunities outside of those at work, in the shops, out running, cycling, to show and to live and to delight in the love of God and to display the, the wonder of the love of God. To people who do not get it. And the thing is, we didn't get it until we got it. It's like Drika said, Hello, Vietni, what does Vietni? What Vietons? Now we know. They didn't know. We didn't know. We didn't know what God is like. We feared Him, not with a holy, reverent fear, but with a, with a fear of the God that sends someone to hell. And so there's people all around you just waiting for you to make him known. Because you know him. Because you have found him. Because you have fallen in love with him. We would love to, to ask that you would take a couple of days, maybe only one, but maybe three days this week, starting tomorrow, to fast. And you can fast in, in your own way whether it's a water fast or a, a Daniel fast or a fast of coffee or whatever it might, might be. But the point is, it's not to fast. The point is to, to focus. And what I would love us to focus on is a revelation of God's love for us. A new and a fresh revelation for God's love for you. Maybe... As you start fasting, have a, have a book and a, and a pen nearby. Have a bit of a journal and write down how God loves you, how he lavishes his love upon you. And let's not only look at his, his hand when we write that down. Let's look at his face. A revelation of his love for you. Secondly, maybe to repent of our own I want to say bad thoughts, our own bad theology regarding the love of God, regarding who He is. Someone once said that bad theology will not cause you to go to hell, but bad theology will, will cause you to believe a lot of really bad things about God. Repenting of our old bad theologies and beliefs. And thirdly, to become, of his, to become aware of his love for others. Simply to become aware of his love for others. Because there's some people that, that I walk past, drive past, and I don't love them. Because in, 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 this, in this world, in this society, they, they're not deserving. So let's stop and become aware of his love for them. Let's start there. Let's start. We'll, we'll get there in weeks to come. His love for them. How he sees them. You know that, that person, wherever, person that you do not necessarily love yet? Let's so ask God, God, just for the moment, just help me to see this person as you see them. And slowly change my heart. But don't even go there. Don't even ask him to change your heart yet. Your heart will change when you start to see how God sees people. Amen.
Thanks, Basun. So yeah, um, bit of homework. <laughs> it's not really homework. Uh, just so you'd all know about that fasting, it is a it is a spiritual act that we need to partake in. And what happens when you fast is uh, you are de- you are denying the flesh. There's this battle between spirit and flesh. So it's a good thing to do because when your spirit is aware, you'll hear what the Father is saying. So let's do this thing together. And next week we'll hear testimonies of what the Father is saying. It'll be brilliant. All right. If there's anybody that needs any prayer, we would love to pray with you. If not, there's um, tea and coffee through there. Make yourself at home and hopefully you feel welcome. Oh, and Linga, coffee shop. Coffee shop at the back. There's coffee at the back there also. All right. Thanks, very well. Thanks for being a part of it this morning. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you through the week.